Well, good morning. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. If you're using a Bible in the seat back in front of you, it's page 814 on that Bible there in the seat back. I want to thank my sister Sally for reading our passage today. Wonderful job, Sally. We're continuing in our Advent series this morning. And when you hear that word Advent, many of you know this, it comes from just the Latin word meaning coming. But as the church has used that word for hundreds of years, it is referring to a season of preparation. A season of preparation in the weeks before Christmas that lead us to Christmas. So as we're using the word Advent here, I want you to constantly be thinking, am I prepared? Am I prepared to worship Christ at Christmas this year? And that is, that is what's most at stake every Christmas. This is what is most at stake every Christmas church family at Christmas. Who or what will you worship? Who or what? Will you worship? Will I worship during this Christmas season? That's what's most at stake. Not not primarily things like, will, will we get all the family together? Will we get the wrong presents? Will I cook the right meal? Will I get to travel where I, I want to travel? Will I get to see everybody I want to see? Uh, will I get to take part in that moving uh, Christmas tradition, all, all of those things can be good questions. They can be, they can be important questions, but they're not most important. They're not what's most at stake for all of us every Christmas. What's most at stake, just to make this clear, every Christmas is this question, who or what will you worship at Christmas? So as we approach Matthew 9, 9 through 13 together, I've prayed Many people this morning and this week have prayed that God would use this passage to this end for us. Would lift our eyes to see our Christ in this passage. He would help us to see clearer ourselves in this passage. And the heights of Christ's mercy and grace and the purpose for coming as we celebrate his coming at Christmas. And, and my thought is, and my belief is, is that if we can see this, and if we can see ultimately him in our passage today, that the Lord can turn any kind of superficial enthusiasm that we could have at Christmas, he can turn any kind of superficial, kind of light enthusiasm that we could have at Christmas into deep and heartfelt joy at Christmas. And he can turn any apathy and indifference that we might feel around this season, he can turn that into adoration and amazement at our Savior. And he can use this passage, and we've prayed today, that if you're here and at Christmas you struggle with dread or depression at Christmas, that he can work in your heart to see Christ and have your soul stirred with delight in your Savior. So we want to direct our attention to Matthew 9 together. We want to see, you've heard already, what the topic for today is, that Jesus came to save sinners. And if I could give you an extended main idea, it would be this today. At Christmas, as I've put this in a Christmas series that we're in. At Christmas, we worship the Christ who came to save sinners effectively, extravagantly, and exclusively. That's what I believe we'll see in our passage today, that we'll be led to worship the Christ who came to save sinners effectively, extravagantly, and exclusively. So let's take that first point, and we'll see this in one short verse, okay? And maybe verse 9 at first glance just seems incidental or, or just, it's not saying very much, but I think in closer investigation, it's saying more than we first 
think it is sane. I want us to see in this first point that Jesus came to save sinners effectively. Let's read verse 9 together. Look down, if you would, in your, in your Bible or on the screens, I think it'll maybe be. But as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. That's what verse 9 tells us. When Jesus calls Matthew, Matthew rose and he left everything, Luke's gospel tells us, immediately to follow Christ. Now to understand more what's going on, we need to know a little bit about Matthew and his character um, to know what's going on here. The Bible tells us here in this text that Matthew's a tax collector. We know by his name that Matthew um, was Jewish. But by his occupation, a tax collector, we, we need to know what this meant in context. We, we know some have said that tax collectors lived on the despised outskirts of Jewish culture and life. This, is, this was tax collectors. They lived on the despised outskirts of Jewish life. Tax collectors were sellouts. Tax, tax collectors were traitors to their own people. He had chosen allegiance to the Romans who were oppressing, oppressing God's people. Basically, he had chosen that allegiance to help himself because his occupation was no help to the Jewish people. And again, it was part of how the Romans over and over oppressed the Jewish people. And the tax booth in verse 9 that you're seeing, the tax booth, as it's called, it was, it, this was a customs booth. This was a customs booth in a place where taxes were taken from Jewish people, stolen from Jewish people. And in all kinds of unjust ways. So when you hear the word tax booth in this section, you need to be thinking from the, from the, from the original audience hearing this, they would have, this, this would have been synonymous with sin and sinners. Okay? Tax booth was essentially synonymous with sin and sinners. So Matthew's words here about himself, they're not just throwaway words. Matthew was sitting at the tax booth. Hearing or reading these words in the original context, if you were the original audience, it would have incited feelings of fear, hate, disgust. So it's amazing. Even in one verse, we're starting to see, it's amazing that Jesus would come and have anything to do with a man like Matthew. And not just have something to do with Matthew, to call Matthew to follow him as a disciple. Jesus would call Matthew to follow him as a disciple. But what's also amazing that I want us to see in this first point is that this kind of a man, this kind of a man would leave his post, would leave his occupation immediately when Jesus speaks to him, follow me. When Jesus calls Matthew, Matthew rose and he left everything immediately to follow his shepherd. And even if you've, even if you've maybe not grown up reading the Bible and you're reading through the Gospels, this verse would seem strange to you probably. You'd read it and you go, why in the world would Matthew do that? Does he know something about Jesus? Does he, why would he do that? That's a strange, that seems like a strange verse, even if you've not read much of the Bible. And some, some have tried to say, I think that probably explains it. Matthew must have known something about Jesus beforehand. Or some have, some have said, um, his conscience, I think, was bearing down on him. Um, and I think it was, it was uh, tormenting him. So that when Jesus calls him, he was, he was ready to come. Some of that, it may be true, but I don't think it's primarily what Matthew wants us to see. I don't think it's primarily what we are to glean from this verse. Instead, 
I think the Bible shows us over and over that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the Word of God in John 1, who has all authority, calls Matthew to follow him. And that call is effective. When Jesus calls his other disciples in Matthew 4, verse 18, at the very beginning of his ministry, the exact same thing took place. They left their occupation immediately. Some of them left their father who was with them, which would have been unheard of, unthinkable, left their occupation immediately at the call of their Savior. Just in the immediate context of our text here, I want us to see something. And if you, if you have your Bible, you can turn one page to the left to Matthew 8. You don't have to turn there, but invite you to turn to Matthew 8, verses 8 through 10, in the section about the centurion. Always want to let Scripture interpret Scripture, right? Especially these verses that are in context with other verses. What do we learn about Jesus from the centurion? Well, the centurion recognizes Jesus. Do you remember the story? And he comes to him and says, would you heal my servant? Jesus, you don't even have to come to my house. You remember what he says to him in verse 8? Only say the word and my servant will be healed. And he goes on to say, look at what he says. I too am a man under authority. With soldiers under me, I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And then it says something really interesting. And when Jesus heard these words, he marveled. Only two places, I think, in all the Gospels say that Jesus marveled at something. In other words, we're being told the centurion has got Jesus right. He has got Jesus' identity right. That even more than the centurion who had some authority, he's saying, Jesus, I know you have even more authority than me. That all you would have to do is to say the word and my servant will be healed with a word. He knows that Jesus, far more than himself, has all authority to speak with omnipotent effectiveness and bring things about only by saying the word. And we see this over and over. Just in Matthew, many of you went through the long series we had in Matthew that ended just at the beginning of this year in Matthew. And, and what I'm trying to do is let Scripture interpret Scripture of what's going on in Matthew 9, 9. And in Matthew, just in one chapter before, in chapter 8, I just looked at chapter 8, look what we see. We see that disease is healed by a word from Christ in 8, verses 1 through 4. We see that the fiercest storms and the waves of the sea obey his voice when he speaks to them in 8, verses 23 through 27. We see that demons tremble in his presence and he cast them out with a word in chapter 8, verse 16, and in verses 28 through 34. And right before our, our passage today, Jesus raises a paralyzed man. A paralyzed man gets up. He picks up his bed. He walks home in the presence of everybody. Why? Because Jesus said to him, rise. And he rose. And nine, chapter 9, verse 8 says, And when the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. And here we come to Matthew 9, 9, Jesus comes to Matthew and says, follow me. And Matthew rises and follows him. One theologian and commentator has said, in the great readiness and eagerness of Matthew to obey, we see the divine power of the word of Christ. I think he's right. Jesus' all-powerful word and call to Matthew was effective. And beyond, beyond this, beyond just the context of Matthew, the rest of the Bible teaches this plainly, church family. Um, last week, I was thinking, Pastor Blair, when we were in, in John 10, last week in John 10, you remember we read the words in verse 3 of John 10, Jesus came to call his own by name and lead them out. 
And then the very next verse says this. Listen to this word. His sheep, it says, will follow him and they will know his voice. John 10 verse 4. Perhaps the most famous statement in all the Bible is in Romans 8.30 that says those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Christ's call to Matthew, church family, a sinner, was effective. And I, if I can just apply this for a moment for us at Christmas time, why, why, would this, why is this encouraging? Why would this be relevant? Well, at Christmas, we celebrate the great rescue mission. Don't we say this? We celebrate the great rescue mission of Jesus. He came to rescue sinners, right, from, their, from our bondage. But, but isn't it great news to know that his rescue mission would be successful. We're not left wondering, I don't know, I don't know. Will it, will it succeed? He came to call sinners. He came to save sinners effectively. And John 17 tells us he would also come and guard them so that not one of them would be lost. That's amazing. So Jesus was not, church family, on a rescue mission to save sinners planned from eternity past with an outcome that was uncertain. He came to save sinners like Matthew effectively. And at least in two ways, this should encourage us. In two ways, at least, this should encourage us. When we think, church family, about our own testimony, when we think about just in general what we needed saving from, this is really good news. As we study the scriptures, we're told continually that when we were lost and apart from the Lord, we, we were depraved. And John 3.19 says we loved the darkness rather than the light. Our hearts and our minds, we're told in scripture, we're set on the flesh in such a way that we could not please God. Romans 8, verses 7 and 8 tell us that. The Bible speaks about a kind of bondage that we were held in, a kind of total enslavement, a deadness in Ephesians 2 and Colossians 2. This is what we needed rescuing from. And so when we read in Scripture, church family, but God... That's why our hearts should rise to worship him. But God, who was rich in mercy, came and called us out of our darkness. And he brought us into marvelous new life. Amen? But God, who was powerful to save. This also, the second way that I think this should encourage us, is it gives us great hope in hopeless, seemingly hopeless situations, especially when we're thinking about evangelism. Have you ever thought, you know, that person, I don't think they could ever be saved. That person is too far from the Lord. I don't think he could be saved. Th this person, I think he's too deep in his sin. This person over here, I think he's too far in another world religion. I don't think he could be saved. Have you ever thought things like that? Sure, we've never said that out loud. Haven't we thought that things like that? This truth should give us courage, church family. If we've thought things like that in the past, I just want to encourage us that, brothers and sisters, we, when we think things like that, we're denying the power of Christ and his gospel. We're denying it. He still today is speaking his omnipotent word through the gospel that's proclaimed to bring sinners out of their darkness and into marvelous light. Amen? He really is... Keep sharing, keep praying, keep trusting that Christ will work powerfully through the gospel that's preached even today. So we see with this sinful tax collector, Matthew, that Christ came to save sinners 
effectively. And that's really good news. His rescue mission would be successful. But the second thing we see, not only did Jesus come to save sinners effectively, but he came to save sinners extravagantly. Now, some of you know what that word means, extravagant, extravagantly, but I just want to help us know what I mean. And when I've just looked up a definition, this is what I mean by extravagantly. Okay. So everyone's clear. Spending much more than is necessary. The first one of the first definitions, spending much more on someone or something that seems necessary. And some might even say can seem wasteful. Or we could define it this way, being extravagant is going beyond what is deserved or justified. Even if you're here and you know Christ, you instinctually know that this is the kind of love that you've been shown. But sometimes we need to be reminded of it, right? Over and over. Let's look at verses 10 and 11 together. Let's read them. Verses 10 and 11. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, we know from Luke and Mark, by the way, that this is Matthew's house. So he's come to Matthew's house. He's reclining at his house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came. And we're reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So I want us to notice what Matthew wants us to notice, especially in these verses. And I think a clue is we see the word, you see the word in the middle of verse 10, Behold, see that word, behold? It just means look, or it means see this. It's right there in the middle of the verse. And what I think he wants us to see is what he says right after that, is, is, is this. Jesus wasn't merely allowing one lucky sinner, Matthew, to come into his presence and recline with him. But he's allowing many sinners and tax collectors to dine with him. Not just one lucky sinner. Matthew wants to see, behold, many were coming to dine with Jesus. And many of us know, maybe we don't though, that meals at this time represented great love and intimacy. Maybe some of you, even today, that's what mealtimes represent, but we've lost some of that, I think, in some of our society today. But at this time, meals were a a display of love and intimacy with the people that you were dining with. And I think the NIV misses the picture. I love the NIV for other reasons, but here I think it misses it because I think it translates verse 10 as like he was going to dinner, he was going to eat and say things like that. But the ESV and the NASB, I think, catch the picture more when it says that Jesus reclined at table. Jesus reclined at table, and then it goes on, repeats, sinners came and were reclining with Jesus. And I just want, church family, I I just want us to see this this morning. I just want us to see this, and I just want us to think of this. That in the context of Matthew, in the context of the Bible, that the Christ, the eternal word, of John 1, the eternal word made flesh, John 1 teaches us. This Christ who was the radiance of the glory of God in Hebrews chapter 1. The eternal son who Philippians 2 tells us he had equality with God. This Christ who created all things in heaven and on earth. And all those things were created, Colossians 1 says, For him. He was before all things, Colossians tells us. And in Christ, this Christ that we're seeing in this passage, all things are being held together. And this Christ, this Christ, is reclining on the floor with the despised outskirts of Jewish society. I mean, just picture that. Just think of it. 
I mean, to, to, to recline at table with people at this time was almost to, to be leaning in nearly their lap, to, to be leaning against their chest a lot of the times. Jesus is not sitting on a bar stool on the other side of the room. He's reclining on the floor with sinners and tax collectors. This Christ, this transcendent, holy Christ who's holding the universe together, look how far down he comes to save those who are in need of his grace. And we need, church family, we need to let this affect us. Not only at Christmas, but especially at Christmas. This needs to be to sink deep down in our hearts. We need to see from this passage what's going on. I, I was thinking about this week. Imagine for, uh, w- with me for a moment, imagine a king had a kingdom. Imagine a king had a kingdom and this king had servants in the kingdom. And they, he was a good king, he was a just king, he was a loving king, and they rebel against him. And he justly banishes them out of the kingdom. It would be remarkable grace for a king like that to let those people back into his kingdom if they ever returned. That would be remarkable grace. But I want us to see what the Bible says and what the biblical gospel is, is so much more than that. It's so much more gracious than that. Jesus came as the king of heaven. We're seeing in this passage, and he does far more than this. But he himself pursues his rebellious, sinful servants. Not only to bring them back into his kingdom, but to gather them around himself and let them be in his presence. That's amazing. That's amazing. It should take our breath away, church family. It should take stony parts of our heart and make them soft. This is what the gospel does to us. It makes us humble when we see the heights of his glory and the depths of his grace. And we see it especially at Christmas time. Many of you, as, you, as I'm telling that story, you may be thinking of the parable of the prodigal son. You remember the story of the prodigal son? This was the logic of the son. Do you remember? When he leaves his father and he squanders everything, he's alienated from him, and it says that he sees how awful his life is. And he says to himself, I'll go back and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against you. Listen, I'm not worthy to be called your son. So treat me as a hired servant. And as far as he was concerned, that would be gracious for his father to do. But that's not what the father does, right? He lavishes his grace on this sinful son, doesn't he? He welcomes him back into his presence and he throws a party and a meal for him, doesn't he? And Jesus, as the perfect reflection of his father in this passage, goes far beyond. He extravagantly goes way beyond what is justified with all who come to him in faith. Does he not? We're going to see in just a moment. We should see ourselves with this group of sinners around Jesus. This is the gospel that we celebrate at Christmas. And by the way, I, I say this in love. I say this in love. But we should never say, church family, we should never say, I don't have a powerful testimony. We should never say that. We should never say, I don't have an exciting testimony. Haven't you heard people say that? I've said that, I think, before. And I'm not saying that to diminish anyone's unique and special testimony that God works in amazingly powerful ways in our lives. But when we see, church family, the the biblical gospel, who we were, and the heights of who Christ is, and what he came to do for us, none of us should ever say, or say, or say things like that to other people. We should say, let me tell you what my God has done for us. Let me tell you what my God has done for me. There's so many stories in the Bible that, that teach us this. 
but no one should ever say, I don't have a powerful testimony. If you're here and at Christmas, you struggle with apathy, I mentioned that at the beginning. Church family, this should serve, if you meditate on this, Jesus' extravagant grace to you. It should catapult you. It should catapult you to extravagant worship of him. It really should. It often shows that we have a lackluster small view of the gospel. And it's why we don't respond in reverence and awe as we should so often. So Jesus not only came to call sinners effectively at Christmas, he not only came to call sinners extravagantly at Christmas, but he came to call sinners exclusively at Christmas. Look at verses 12 and 13 with me. He came to call sinners exclusively at at Christmas. When he heard it, now remember, he's responding to the question that verse 11, the, the Pharisee said, when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So in verses 12 through 13, Jesus, you get the context, he's responding to the question that the Pharisees have asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And his answer in verse 12 is, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Do you see what he's saying? I'm the great physician. Jesus is the great physician in the Gospels. Those who think they're well never come to him. Those who think they're well would seek to justify themselves and seek righteousness on their own effort, like the Pharisees were. But those people don't come to the Lord for help. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Then Jesus quotes Hosea 6. So I don't know if you write in your Bibles. I'm sure your footnotes say this. If you write in your Bibles, you can write Hosea 6, 6 in the margin if you want. That's what Jesus quotes here when he says, go and learn what this means. Now he's belittling them because here are the Pharisees. They're the teachers. And go and learn what this means was a common rabbinic phrase that that teachers would teach their disciples in this way. So you see, he's, trying to, he's teaching them like he would teach a student who doesn't know anything. Go and learn what this means, he says to the Pharisees. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So he quotes Hosea 6.6. 6, and so how, how is he using that? Well, I think on one level, he does this. He quotes Hosea 6.6 6 to vindicate and explain his own actions, because after all, that's what they're doing. They're, they're questioning Jesus' actions, the audacity they would, he would have to get on the floor and dine with sinners and the outcast of society. So he's vindicating and explaining his own actions by quoting it, but he's also, at a deeper level, he's exposing the bankrupt, pharisaical problem, which, by the way, plagues so many of us still today. He's exposing this deepest pharisaical problem that we love to pay close attention to all matters of the externals of our lives and religiosity and coming to church and and leading Bible studies and doing all kinds of religious expressions on the outside, but neglect the deeper and weightier matters of the law. Matthew 23, 23 makes this clear. He says that you guys in Matthew 23, 23 have neglected the weightier matters of the law. And he calls those justice, mercy, and faithfulness. What what about us? Have we, church family, have any of us neglected the weightier matters of the law and have missed the biblical gospel? Jesus came not to call the righteous, but sinners only. That's what I mean by exclusively. So so in other words, Jesus did not come to call sinners plus some other kinds of people as well. Or sinners plus other kinds of categories of people as well. This is one category of people he came to save, and then there's many others. Jesus is saying, I have only come to save sinners. 
Isn't that great news? If you've peered inside your own heart and have seen the sin there, you should know that that is wonderful news. Have you ever heard the phrase, Jesus helps those who help themselves? Don't believe that. It's not true. That's the slogan of the, of the Pharisees. Jesus helps those who help themselves. With Jesus, it's exactly the opposite. He helps those who cannot help themselves. If you're here and you have parents and you're praying for the salvation of your kids, pray this, that the Lord would help them come to the end of themselves and see that they cannot save themselves, that their sin is a problem and God can save them. He can save them from their sin. Don't try and manage and maintain your child's sin if you're here with kids. Help them know what to do with their sin, where they can take their sin. They can take their sin and sinfulness to the Savior who will save them. They put their trust in him. Do you see yourself as a kind of respectable sinner? I'm a respectable kind of sinner, or I'm a kind of civilized. I'm a civilized sinner. I'm not quite like the other sinners that I've seen over here. I'm a more respectable sinner. Do you see yourself that way? Jesus has no category for that kind of a person. He has no category, and neither should we. Neither should we. So this should humble us, church family. This should humble us. And, and that's, my, that's a question for you. I, are you known? Have you ever asked are you known as someone who is humble? Are you known as someone who's humble? Pride sounds a certain way in our voice, how we talk to people. Pride looks a certain way in how we interact with others, how we posture ourselves around others. Pride can be written on our face sometimes. Have you ever asked someone who's close to you, Am I growing in humility? Am I, am I humble? Do you see humbleness in me? Where do you see evidence of that? If we're not known as humble people, I just want to say lovingly the words that Paul said to Peter in Galatians 2, our lives are not in step with the gospel. If we know the gospel, it should level the playing field. It strips us of all self-righteousness. When we see that Jesus came to save the least of these, the worst of sinners. But I hope that it more than humbles us. I hope you feel, I hope you feel encouraged as well today. Especially if you're here today and you feel stuck in your sin. If you feel lost. If you're here and you wondered, I don't know if Jesus could save me. I think I've done too much. I hope you've heard from this sermon that Jesus has only come to save sinners. You're, if you're here and you feel like you're a horrible sinner and you're unsure if Jesus could save you, hear from Jesus in this passage today. You're exactly the kind of person he wants to save today. You're exactly the kind of person he's come to save. Dane Ortland, in his Gentle and Lowly book, many of you have read that book, um, just says this wonderful quote at the beginning of the book. I just thought it was worth sharing here. He says, the, the only prerequisite of coming to Christ is that you would be a sinner. The only thing that should be a prerequisite in coming to Christ is that you see yourself as a sinner. If you're here today and you're not in Christ and you're going, I need to go do this first. I need to clean this area of my life up first. I need to do this. I probably should do that before I bring myself to Jesus. Jesus says, no. Bring all of your junk. Bring all of your filth. Bring all of your sin to me. And I will give you rest for your soul. I'll save you. So how do we respond to this today? First, if you're here today and you're stuck in sin, just like the person I was just speaking to, if you're stuck in sin and still wondering, can I be saved? Hear Jesus' words today. He can and he will. 
I don't know everybody in this room, but he can and he will save all those who call to him. And the first response is hear the words of John 6, 37. All who are here and wondering if Jesus could save me and all of my junk, John 6, 37 says, all who come to me, Jesus says, I will never cast out. All who come to Christ in faith, he'll never cast out. All who come to Jesus, he'll never cast out. That is great news. In just a moment, I'll stand here at the front. Blair will be at the front. Corey's here. Justin's back there. Come find us. During that song, you're welcome to come and find us. If you want to know more about Jesus saving you, and Jesus is never, and you feel like your sins are still hanging over your conscience and hanging over your life, and you still stand apart from the Lord, Your sins can be taken care of today in Christ because he came to save sinners. For the rest of us today, if you're here and you're in Christ, here's how the rest of us, I think, can respond. Number two, we should have a renewed trust and we should have a renewed courage, especially tonight as we'll be commissioned out with our candle lighting to be lights in the world. As Christ came as the light of the world, we'll be commissioned out tonight to be lights in a dark world. We should have a renewed trust and courage in our evangelism when we see Christ's effective call to Matthew. When we share the gospel today, we are bringing the word of Christ to sinners. I said, a moment, I said earlier, keep praying, keep trusting. This should give you great confidence when you bring the gospel. It's, you're the mailman. You've heard us say that before. We bring the omnipotent power of the Lord. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says. Why? It is the power of God for salvation to the Jew and to everybody. Have renewed courage that it's not up to your amazing eloquence and your amazing gospel presentation has to be just right. God works in the simplest presentations of the gospel to bring people out of darkness and into light powerfully. Have, take heart, church family, in your evangelism. Take courage in it. Number three, I think we should respond with deep humility and gratitude. I've spoken about this already. There is no place, I want to say this so resoundingly, there is no place for pride or entitlement in the hearts of Christ followers, there is no place for pride and entitlement in the hearts of those who have found forgiveness in their Savior. Again, I ask, are you known as someone who's growing in humility, growing in gratitude in your hearts? Lastly, we should respond, number four, we should respond in extravagant worship extravagant worship and I just want to remind us what this can look like what does extravagant worship look like Luke chapter 7 verses 36 and 50 you don't have to turn there but it's the story of the sinful woman that's forgiven you remember that you remember the story the sinful woman that's forgiven and the tables have flipped in that story Jesus is in the house of a Pharisee, Simon, in that story. And you have a sinful woman that looks on and she understands what Jesus has came to do. And she falls to her knees, weeping with her tears. And the expensive ointment and perfume, she lavishes extravagantly this this washing Christ's feet. And Simon says, he's thinking to himself, if you knew who that was, you would would know that she's a sinner. And do you remember what he says to Simon? He says, let me tell you something, Simon. He said, there was a a money lender. He had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, one owed 50. When they both couldn't pay, the Lord forgave them both. Or the master forgave them both. Which do you think he Which do you think will love him more? And Simon says, well, I suppose the one to whom you forgave the larger debt. Listen to that insight, church family. If you want to worship Jesus extravagantly this Christmas, do you understand what you have been forgiven from? This should, 
it, when we see Christ's extravagant display of grace and love towards us, it calls for extravagant devotion and praise and worship for him. If you find your heart in kind of an apathetic, lackluster devotion and worship of the Lord at Christmas, go and study Luke 7, 36, and, and, and realize to the degree that I see how much I've been forgiven, to that same degree my heart can rise and soar with gratitude and extravagant response to Christ. Amen? Amen? So we should respond with extravagant worship this Christmas. I want, I want to just give you a few verses quickly and then I'll pray. These verses are just, maybe you're wondering, could I just further reflect on this? Well, reflect on this passage. Reflect on Matthew 9, 9 through 13. Reflect on Luke, the one we just talked about, Luke 7, 36 through 50. Reflect on passages like Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Reflect deeply, meditate on places like Psalm 113. That was our call to worship today. Luke 15, 11 through 32, the parable of the prodigal son. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. So many more we could say. Go spend time in these passages and think about them. Pray about them as a family, as individuals. And see what the Lord might do in raising your affections for Christ at Christmas time. Let me pray for us. Father, we come to you amazed at the work of your son. That he would come and save sinners like me. Lord, we rejoice that you came and you powerfully called us out of darkness into marvelous light. And we rejoice that you did not hold back your grace and mercy towards us, but you lavished us so that in the coming ages, you would make known your grace and kindness towards those who have put their trust in you. Oh Lord, would you magnify your name this Christmas as you make known over and over through our lips and through testimony after testimony, your grace and your kindness that you've shown to those who have put their faith in Jesus as we think about why he came. I pray that we would respond, Lord, now and this Christmas with extravagant worship, deep humility, deep gratitude in our hearts, and we would be a gospel people that are shaped by this news over and over, even in the new year. Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.